together we are. Ooh, whoa, whoa, whoa. Dating, that's what girls do. And I'm a capital D dude. I only eat Doritos and play FPS games. This is a cootie free zone. Shh. Uh, sir, we've got a cootie outbreak. Through contract tracing, we found that you were getting a lot of cooties from Captain Price just in a bro manly way. When I was. A young boy. I found myself in an environment where boys were expected to play Call of Duty and get called slurs by other 12 year olds. Growing up in the rural Midwest, there was this unspoken idea that you would conform to fit in lest you be ostracized for being the Mario or Sonic enjoyer you truly are. I mean, those games are bright, colorful, whimsical, fun, but we're pushing 13, it's time to get serious. Only games where you shoot waves of zombies and it plays the Friday the 13th song for as long as the copyright can hold for me. And yet I found myself inexplicably drawn to a softer, feminine world. I can still remember the addiction that hooked me as a teenager watching Press Heart to continue play Always Remember Me. A Locky run-of-the-mill dating sim where your dreamboat anime boyfriend suffers a horrible car accident that luckily left him a hunky dreamboat anime boyfriend but did make him lose all of his memories of you, our female protagonist. A quick aside, it's such a bewildering choice that one of several dating options is the one who suffers from amnesia and not like you, our protagonist, who was in a committed relationship and now is grappling with either rekindling your relationship with a man forever changed or just like moving on to the next boy toy. It presents such an absurdly dark moral conflict and such a lighthearted teenage girl focused game and wait 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 hold on mom get the Baja Blast I've got to get my keynote therapy right now. I'll just play a racing game. That's manly, right? That's boy stuff, right? Wait, who? Your name is Robert Chrisman? We're gonna be working together? You're passionately defending me from your boss? I thought I turned off the dating sim, right? The dam has been breached. The glasses are off. I see the world for what it truly is. It's all dating sims? Always has been. Dating sim is a term that has a really derogatory connotation. Those are either for depressed losers or, even worse, girls. But I think we've been subtly indoctrinated into the dating sim genre all along. Big video game wants you to have flourishing relationships. Some are just a bit more subtle about it than those that solemnly don the title of dating sim. In this video, I'm going to present to you a variety of games that you might not consider to be dating sims and show you exactly how they are and perhaps the more insight we gain into the many shadowy forms a dating sim can assume, we might start to understand what that term truly means and how maybe that title isn't as sinful as it first appears. And what better place to start than where you would least expect? NBA 2K15, that's right, basketball baby, and no, I'm not talking about NBA 2K16 featuring a Spike Lee joint. No, I'm not going to talk about whatever the afterthought product placement story mode of the current NBA 2K looks like. I'm going to focus squarely on 2K15 and a little bit of 2K14, in part because that's when the basketball story mode was at its most ambitious, and also because it's the one I happen to play the most. Side note, NBA 2K15 is now nearly a decade old. Ruminate on that one for a bit. For those sports game outsiders, NBA 2K is a series most widely known and played for its My Player mode, a mode which allows you to create your own player, play through the game offline as just one guy on a team, including sitting on the bench when your player is benched and otherwise, though largely to play online with others. It's an idea that other sports games have mimicked to varying levels of success, but due to basketball being such an individualized 
decentralized sport, despite being played as a team, it's an idea that works particularly well here. However, in 2015, online and video games was still a mild novelty. Most players were still only using full teams in the online mode. My Park was a relatively new concept and has since become the main focus of the My Player feature, but here, the developers were not really sure if players would be online or offline, and so we got our most ambitious story mode yet. That's right, you can immerse yourself in the game more than ever before with voice acting from actual NBA players. Amazing, right? Right? Listen to the culture, and the result will take care of themselves. Because at the end of the day, it's not about the money, the nice hotel, the private jets. Remember that and you will be fine, okay? Yeah. Oh. That's right. We all have that attitude. The train will be rolling in no time. Let's do it. Oh, no. Who had thought? About what? That a young buck like you could actually do the right thing and avoid getting his sorry butt kicked out the hold game. Me back. He told me to chill. Sounds like a wise fella to win in this league. You need all oh, hands on no. deck. That's right. That's where the dating sim comes in. You see, basketball is an individualized sport, but it's still played as a team. As such, the devs have made multiple attempts to immerse players in the social aspect of the game, ranging from enemy players issuing you challenges for you to meet, and the occasional romance cutscene. Oh, and in 2K14 onwards, when you successfully met the challenges issued or just played particularly well, there was a chance that enemy players would start following you on in-game, nondescript social media. Uh. Get out of here, Persona 3. I'm collecting my own harem of best girls, and their names are Mo Williams and Emeka Okafor. Aww. Now, the depth of this dating sim is actually fairly underappreciated, as depending on your team, and there are 30 of them, you would get a different romance option. Though sadly, the romance cutscenes only extend to the first season of gameplay and disappear afterwards. That's right, if you want to experience every romance, you're going to need to replay the game 30 times. Tokimeki Memorial can get straight up dunked on. I will confess, I'm more partial to 2K14's dating sim. While it's far less personal, or personalized, there's something so endearing about a basketball game where if you perform poorly or lose the game, you are forced to answer to the press and your teammates. This is not skippable, this is part of the core gameplay loop. Oh, and if you ever wondered where my name comes from, my older brother said my character looked like a jabroni, and I just decided that was his last name, and misspelled it. Yep, getting the deep lore here. I think 2K15 is more of a fun novelty, but 14 was really the last sports game I got truly immersed in, and I think the heavy focus on after hours communicating, whether it be the social media feed, or the press conferences, or literally barging into your manager's office to demand a trade, it all did so much to really convince me I was in the NBA, and I wanted to see Jabroni flourish. He'll always hold a special place in my heart. So, okay, NBA 2K is really the standout sport game for being secretly a dating sim. Surely there's nothing else that even comes close to blurring those lines in the sports genre, right? I mean, sure, you could point to something like Captain Tsubasa for being literally a sports game with a heavy amount of visual novel content, but that's not unexpected. It's too easy. What if I told you there's another sport game with an even heavier heavier dating sim element than even Captain Tsubasa has to offer, hidden within plain 
about sight. Recently, I bought a month of the highest tier PlayStation Plus just to gawk at some goofy old games with my girlfriend for a bit. My PS4 is at this point nearly 11 years old, so it makes sense that I just don't get to use it as much these days, but I'm a human, I grow attached to inanimate objects, same as everybody else, and that's how I ended up seeing the racing game whose music I had used in my at the time most recent video and went, huh. Worst case scenario, I'm playing a boring racing game with some good music, so sure, I'll give R4 Ridge Racer Type 4 a go. So yeah, the music in this game is killer, but what's almost bizarre is how heavy an emphasis this game places on how racing automatically makes you the coolest person on the planet. It's what everyone aspires to be and what the suits and sleaze of the world want to deny. I ate Taco Bell and I'm burpy. Frankly, I don't know how you can witness the opening cutscene of this game and not immediately become enamored. In multiple promotional materials for the game, it doesn't even include cars. Just this lady named Reiko Nagase, whose name, aside from a quick flash in the intro video, is never mentioned in the gameplay itself, but instead is included in the promotional material for the game, alongside really critical information, like the fact that her blood type is A, and her favorite holiday is to take her pet dog Ricky for a walk. Women do be shopping. I think racing games are a particularly hard game to watch or to advertise as fun. Like yeah, the car goes forward and occasionally turns. Cool. So instead of advertising cars, they advertise the very idea of how cool cars are and how this lady thinks they're cool so clearly they're cool, and it doesn't end at the opening cutscene. The very menus themselves are at first a bit difficult to parse because of how absurdly stylish and iconic they look. I have genuinely never seen anything like it, and that especially applies to the dating sim cutscene. Scenes. Okay, I need to reel myself in. There's just so much going on with this game, it is incredibly easy to get off track. Get it? Get it? Do you get it? So, the story mode of this game, referred to as Grand Prix, is one of the most in-depth dating sims I have ever seen in my life. After a brief explainer, you choose from one of four teams, essentially picking both your difficulty level but who your romance path will be for this playthrough. It's here that we see our four eligible bachelors. Sophie Chevalier, the French team manager whose passion has always been in racing but whose father has arranged a marriage for her so she can drop her passion and presumably be a trophy wife. Shinji Yazaki, the Japanese team manager who's fairly straightforward but will eventually reveal to you his personal history and tragedy associated with racing. Enki Gilbert, Enki Gilbert, Enke Gilbert, the Italian team manager who's a perfectionist that doesn't let his personal feelings get in the way of demanding the best from his team. And lastly, Robert Chrisman, the American team manager who mostly serves as a liaison for the team's money-focused owner, who has doomed the team to mediocrity in the name of profit. Contestant number four, if we went on a first date, where would you take me? Uh, the racetrack. <laughs> While obviously the objective of Grand Prix is to win the Grand Prix, the real depth of the gameplay here comes from the dating sim. No matter what team you pick, you'll be doing the same races and you have an option of four car companies which will all give you the same toys to play with regardless of which team you play with them as. So there's really only four choices, and the impact each car has on gameplay really only extends to is quick or 
drifts. But in this dating sim comes an intricate web of branching paths depending on your placement in each race. Okay, the Grand Prix has a total of eight races broken up into three stages. In stage one, you'll need to finish in the top three for two races, stage two the top two, and in stage three you'll need to get first place four races in a row. Before and after each race, you'll get a chance to chat with your prospective romance, learn a bit of info about the race you'll be getting into, but more importantly, you'll learn a bit more about the romance partner themselves. After the race, they'll comment on your performance, which, wow cool, they have a throwaway line in there in case you finish third instead of first. Nice. Oh, hold on, we've moved on to the next race and you're still referring to my third place finish? Well, that's interesting, I'm surprised they would commit that deeply. Wait, hold on, I'm in a whole different stage and you are still referring back to how I did in the first race? That's right. The dialogue system changes based on how well you do in any race, meaning if you want the quote unquote true ending to any path, you'll need to place first in every race. And there are no do-overs. If you fail to meet the minimum placement requirements, you'll get a game over and be forced to use one of your three continues you're allotted. But what's even more shocking is that while you redo the race you lost, as you would expect, after the race, your potential love interest will actually remember that you lost on your first attempt. This demerit will go on your permanent record. If you decide to throw a race to try and get another shot at first, place rather than finish second, that'll be seen as even worse in the eyes of your partner. After a successful Grand Prix, your reward isn't so much the satisfaction of having beat the game as it is getting to see your partner fulfilled and happy, whatever those circumstances may be. You're not just racing to win, you're doing it for them. And then a bunch of cars park in a parking lot and make a big R because truly <laughs> racing brings us all together. I love cars! <laughs> I think this game was so ahead of its time across the board and I would love to gush about it even more, but I seriously think you need to experience Ridge Racer Type 4 firsthand. It epitomizes the word experience. It's transcendent of the genre. It's astounding. Something particularly ahead of its time is the realization that the key to adding production value and critical prominence to your video game is to orient it around a compelling story. We live in a world now where God of War is best known as a compelling take on fatherhood and not just mindless violence and sex jokes. And that world R4 predates by about six years. Hey, quick intermission from Editor Connor. <laughs> if you've watched this far in the video, I hope you'll consider subscribing and liking and commenting and all that algorithm junk. This video has taken almost nine months to make and genuinely triple digit hours of work editing, so I hope you're digging it so far. If you want to see more high quality goofery like this, I really hope you'll consider looking at my Patreon or at the very least do me a favor of leaving a comment on your personal favorite favorite dating sim. Just don't say NBA 2K14, that's mine, I already said dibs. I've got a few other videos in the works right now too, and two of them I am hoping to have released sometime before Halloween, so you'll probably want to stick around to check those out. Anyways, that's all the shilling I've got. Back to the video. If you look at the games today that win awards and garner critical acclaim, a common theme is character-driven story. Even what I described in the intro to this video, Call of Duty, particularly in the 360 and PS3 era, tried to build a reputation for being a compelling and cinematic story, and the way that was built was by giving you compelling, memorable characters to latch onto. I can't even count the number of times my friends in middle school would hear a bell ring and say, On your feet, soap, we are leaving! And 
Okay, I realize I'm treading into questionable territory, particularly in how Call of Duty was and is ostensibly a form of propaganda for the United States Army, the way the series has historically blamed other countries for US war crimes, the way that the US military was always specifically targeting poor young men with ad campaigns, and that's a big can of worms for somebody more intelligent to unpack, so I'll just leave it there. But these games were such an integral part of my childhood and many others. Half of the early 2010s internet memes came in the form of montage parodies, themselves parodying a viral trend spawned by these games. And a huge part of what made them so ubiquitous was their knack for telling a genuinely compelling, albeit mindless, story. As it turns out, being a faceless military shoot man is all well and good, but when you introduce stakes, it leaves that much more of an impression. The most memorable levels from these games didn't come from missions where you had to stop the entire world from nuclear detonation. If that was the case, Call of Duty Ghosts with our advanced dog AI and our fish, fish that move, move out, out of the, the way, way would be the most celebrated game in the franchise. The singular level I remember everybody quoting and enjoying the most is one where you play as Captain Price, a character who you as the player have already grown attached to due to his significance in earlier levels, sneaking around behind enemy lines with his mentor in a mission gone wrong. Eventually, you're forced to carry your mortally wounded mentor through a hail of bullets fighting to keep not just yourself, but the one you care about most alive. You don't stop the nuke to save the country. You stop the nuke because Captain Price told you to. But at the end of the day, you're playing the single player because your friends aren't online to play multiplayer with. The games are, after all, simply a way to hang out when you would otherwise be split apart by distance. So isn't the real dating sim the friends we made along the way? No? Uh, uh oh. Um. Well, um, to be honest, I was really shy growing up. I know, a guy who makes YouTube videos about video games was socially stunted? Get the press! That joke is funny because for a while I was oppressed, but none of you knew that, but now you do and I just told you I was socially stunted, so you better be doing that awkward pity laugh right about now. I think that social stunting was a big reason why I found myself drawn to the forbidden fruit of dating sims. I didn't necessarily crave a romantic relationship, but just some sort of deeper connection and general. I had some good friends, and I don't want to downplay the importance they played in my life. A few of them were the very same ones I grew up playing Call of Duty with, but all the same, I found myself spending so many days laying on my bed, a Tupperware of potato chips to one side and my DS on the other, longing for a deeper connection I just couldn't fulfill in my regular life. And then I picked up my DS, and I played Pokemon. Pokemon, uh, okay, this is not a Vaporeon thirst post, I promise. I know there are plenty of Poke freaks on the internet, and I am not one of them. But I do think the only reason we play these games is because of that absurd connection you form with your mons, right? I mean, with every new game that releases, so much of the internet obsesses over how this is the worst one yet in a long line of games that shouldn't be bought. There's got to be something keeping us on the hook. And no, even at the best of times, the stories in Pokemon games have never been interesting or a main appeal. At least not not in the traditional definition of a video game story. When I play Pokemon, I always end up with the same issue every playthrough. Every generation, I've gotta carry this crappy stray dog Pokemon with me for the entire playthrough because he's the first Mon I caught. Here's to you, Zigzagoon, Poochiena, Rockruff, Yamper, Lillipop, Radada, Bidoof, all the rest. <laughs> <laughs>
In a game series forever attached to the phrase gotta catch em all, growing up I found it being more like catch enough to fill up your party and maybe a few extras that look cool and also whatever the legendary for that game was and that's it. Once a Pokemon entered my team, it was heartbreaking to ever even think of removing them, no matter how non-optimal. We set out on this journey together, we're going to see it through to the end. And the funny part is, we know this isn't a one-sided thing. All of your Pokémon have their own friendship meters, and even though the mechanic almost never practically comes up, there is a consequence for failing to maintain your relationships, with Pokémon simply ignoring your commands and doing whatever they want if they don't like you enough. <laughs> They'll tell you that Pokémon up to a certain level will listen to you, but they don't tell you that just by befriending them, that level cap ceases to matter. You get what you give. Recently, I've developed a fondness for Pokemon randomizers, not just for reintroducing the unexpected into a game series I'm familiar with, but also because I know I'll inevitably get attached to the first guys I see. It's like how your entire life can change depending on where you sit in a classroom, who you're sitting next to, who you run into in the hallway. What if it was someone else? What if you formed a relationship with a Thai rogue instead of a zigzagoon? How different would your life have ended up? Okay, okay, I get it. Yes, Pokemon is secretly about forming relationships, but does that actually qualify as a dating sim? I want strictly a utilitarian approach to classifying what is and isn't a dating sim, not this alignment chart approach. Alright, the last I'll say about Pokemon is that it is a series indelibly tied to forming relationships, hanging out together, eating together, sleeping together. If that's not dating, then I don't know what is. But fine, I get it. You need something direct. So let me introduce you to Moe Ma. Okay, no, but for real, you want a Nintendo game that is inarguably a dating sim? Let me introduce you to The Legend of Zelda. Not that one. Nope. Holy crap, guys! Nuh-uh. I'm talking that Kino top shelf this with a fine cabaret, Zelda. Oh yeah. Now that's the good stuff. Most of you probably had no idea this game even existed until today, and I have a feeling you shan't be forgetting it anytime soon. When we talk about Zelda games, often the DS games go forgotten, or if they're brought up at all, it's usually to talk about how they're hated, deserved, or not. But we're not here to talk about how Spirit Tracks is actually totally a really good game. We're here to talk about The Legend of Zelda Japan-only DS spin-off titles, that's right, plural. Freshly picked Tingle's Rosy Rupee Land was actually the first in a two-title series that never escaped captivity, I mean country. But where Rosy Rupee Land was a capitalist dystopia, ripened Tingle's Balloon Trip of Love was a romantic, fantastical isekai all about love in all of its many shapes and forms. Calling this game weird would be like calling a sandwich food, like, no shit. But I just need to highlight the depths of strangeness to be found here with one simple statement. This retelling of The Wizard of Oz is a sequel to a spin-off game about a minor character that really only appears in two games in the Zelda series that shares zero common characters, settings, environments, or motivations with the Zelda series aside from having the character tingle and focusing on his love of rupees and maps except both of those are actually dropped in the sequel and the sequel is almost more apt to be called a spin-off of the spin-off due to the extreme shift in gameplay story and even in the personality of Tingle himself. The sandwich sure is food.
About halfway through the game, you're given the ability to Love Push, a mode where you have to pick the right options to form a bond with five different female characters. <laughs> yup, in order to beat this game, you have to succeed in a dating sim best likened to the kind of half-baked tea time minigame in Fire Emblem Three Houses, which, hey, there's another one of those dating sims in a game that on the box doesn't even mention, uh, well, you know, that's vague enough. In a game that on the box doesn't even mention how a significant part of the game is eating dinner and tea with your students and after a time skip that makes this significantly less weird, eventually falling in love with one of them. This whole section in itself borrowing heavily from JRPGs like Persona 5 and okay we're getting off the rails here. So obviously for most of this video I've been avoiding naming the games that are more blatantly dating sims but I just can't keep the act up any longer. Point the blame to whoever you want, but the fact is that dating mechanics in popular video games have only become more common and frequent. I already showed how the more dating ambiguous games, such as Pokemon, have made forming relationships a larger part of the game as the years go by. We've also seen the mainstreamification of games like Persona 5. We've seen series like Fire Emblem, which had previously Previously been coy about being a dating sim, embrace the mechanic wholeheartedly. We've seen indie games overtake the world whose biggest appeal is you can date the monsters and get into that bone zone, or, or western franchises like Baldur's Gate, who sure, 1 and 2 had some amount of relationships in it, but never as blatantly about exploring a fantasy world with your cabal of hot boys and pretty girls who all want to sleep with each other. Roguelikes, whose primary incentive for playing the game over and over is that maybe this run you'll finally get to see Zagreus Thanatos smut you've been clamoring for. <laughs> Devs and AAA companies have come to realize you just can't sell a game by saying we've got the shiniest graphics. Always Remember Me and all those other strange weird early 2010s dating sims were a herald, a trendsetter, a martyr. They bore the mockery, the taboo, fulfilled the strange fantasy all in the name of giving players a deeper insight into themselves, the world around them, and how those two connect. All games have something to say about us and how we connect together, and thus, all games are dating sims. I'm sorry, but I do make the rules. And if you disagree, that's just like your opinion, man. Consider our social rank on the rocks.